It is a truth universally acknowledged that a person in possession of a large fabric stash must be in want of a new project with which to distract her from the dozens of projects she already has going on. Today I decided that it was time to make an upgrade to my much abused 1850s chemise. This poor, bedraggled, stained, faded chemise. I have worn this as pajamas almost every night for the past three years. I have sweated at balls with this on. I have cooked dinner that splashed onto me. Like there's a hot oil stain. I think there's like a ketchup stain at the bottom and I spilled chocolate milk near the hem once. It was time to upgrade this dingy ass chemise and make a new one. Not that I'm going to throw this one away. I will, I guarantee I will still wear this as my most comfortable pajamas but I'm going to make a new one so that I can at least look presentable when I'm wearing a silk ball gown eventually in the future. The same pattern that I used to make that chemise that I just showed you, I really like this pattern, it is Simplicity 2890. Um, I think it's an out of print pattern. I bought this on eBay for a few bucks a while ago. Um, but it was a really great pattern. I have a few other of the big four um, like Victorian undergarment patterns, but of all of them, this one's my favorite because it doesn't have that much volume in the side, in the body of the um, chemise. And also it doesn't need any additional gores or anything like that. What I like about this pattern too is that most of the big four chemise patterns that you see, they have puffed sleeves. And this one has a very sensible straight cap sleeve, probably best shown on the actual garment. And of most of the um, extant chemises that I've seen from this time have this basic sleeve. This is comfortable. It doesn't bunch up any under any of my tight sleeve dresses. It is so comfortable to wear um, and it's no fuss. Like I'm not going to be doing any extra gathering or stitch work. As you can see, this chemise has no embellishment at all. And that's fine because I wash and wear these like a maniac. So I want them to be as simple and hard wearing as possible. Um, another thing that I really like with this chemise style is that it has this kind of underarm uh, facing. But I've seen these on extant shifts as well, and this one I found very easy to attach. Um, and it's quite wide and it adds some structure to that area, so sometimes when you're sleeping in these, like, you may get it wrapped around your legs and it might pull um, in a certain area. And I think if it weren't for that facing, that this thing would have been in tatters by now, but it's I'm astonished at how well intact it is. Um, really the only problem with it is that the fabric has just stained and discolored beyond help. So I have actually the same fabric that I used to make this chemise. I have like 12 yards of it because I bought a bolt of it once at Joanne's when it was on sale. I'm going to see if I can cut out and sew one of these in a few hours if you're interested in following along. So I'm reconciling some of the changes that I made to the original pattern. So the original pattern has a yoke that dips down like this. It was very challenging for me to do this dip yoke. So I ended up drafting, um, based on this pattern, I drafted a new yoke that went straight across like this. But for this attempt, I would really like to make the pattern exactly as it is. So I don't need that piece, but I do need this one. And I'm cutting, FYI, the smallest size in the pattern, a size 8. Um, I'm actually not going to cut out the size itself, but I'm just going to fold along the cut line as best as I can, and I might make a few snips here. That way, if I ever do need a larger size or I need to lend the pattern to someone, um, I can easily unfold the pattern and they get those sizes, but for now I'm just folding the snipped bits in. There we go. And there's a size 8 yoke. Another thing that I remembered with this uh, chemise is that this back yoke was too big, even though I cut the smallest size. And I ended up having to take some um, darts in the back here. So what I'm going to do is instead of cutting on the fold for size 8, I'm actually going to take in just a little more, just like a half inch, 
and I'm just folding the pattern tissue like that just a half inch to reflect that and that way I won't have to take in these darts because made as it was in the size 8 it was so big it just fell straight down my body. So I've just cut out the body of my chemise. The front and back were both cut on the fold. I recommended cutting chemises parallel to the selvage as apparently this was stronger. Whether that's true or not I have no idea but I felt like taking that uh, mysterious writer's advice. So the instructions tell you to first stay stitch around this marking and then slash and cut to the corners and then run the gathering stitches. I did this the other way around so I stay stitched while I was already at the machine so I wouldn't have to come up to the ironing board again. I went ahead and I did the gathering stitches at the top front of the chemise and I also did the gathering stitches for the top back of the chemise. Now I'm going to go back to step two and I'm going to slash open the neckline. I appreciate that simplicity is putting the most challenging part for me first, so there really is no escaping this placket business, and I am very placket challenged. I struggle with plackets a lot, so this is not, uh, it's not going to be an enjoyable experience for me. Alright, so the next step now is to gather up the stitches here. So I set my machine to 3.5 stitch length. Now a note on stitch length. If you want your 19th century and early 20th century garments to look more like the real thing, a very simple um, and easy way to achieve that is to make your stitch length smaller. I usually set it to 1.5 or 2. Um, and for context, my machine goes as small as one, especially on seams that show like flat felt seams or um, facings that you stitch down or sewing in tucks. If you look at extants, um, either go on eBay or look at museum pieces, um, Etsy, see any close-up shots of antique pieces, especially if you have a particular one you're trying to recreate, and especially for underwear, I've noticed that they just have a smaller stitch length. I find that setting my stitch length as small as it can be, or just above, um, really goes a long way in helping my garments look like they actually came from the time that I'm making them from. Now we are attaching the one of the yoke pieces. We have cut out four yokes for the front. These are going to encase the gathers. I do have a ruffler attachment, which is also very helpful with sewing gathers. However, I find that um, with something like this where I want to adjust the gathers in order to fit a space, I will just do regular machine gathers, even hand sewn gathers, um, but these machine gathers where you pull the bobbin thread because if you use your ruffler foot, you then can't really adjust the size of the gathers after they're sewn. Alrighty, so I have stitched my yoke pieces to the front and back of my chemise. Here we see the back piece with the gathers and that long yoke piece. And then this is the front of the chemise, the gathers, and the two split yoke pieces that will then overlap and button in the front. And this will be covered by another set of yokes. Um, one note when I'm pressing is that I also press from the front just to make sure I haven't missed anything or made the stitching wonky. I, I like to look at it from the front and the back side. Now the pattern has you stitch the yokes, press, and then sew the shoulder seams, but since I was already at the sewing machine, I just went ahead and stitched the shoulder seams, and then I came back to my ironing board, and I pressed the front yoke seam, the shoulder seam, and the back yoke seam. So now the next step is to hem our sleeves. The pattern instructions literally say hem sleeves, and it doesn't tell us how much to hem them. And this is why you should keep your pattern pieces with you, even after you've cut out all the pieces for your garment. Because actually the pattern piece has on it one and a quarter inch hem allowed and that's not mentioned in the instructions. So we are going to start by folding up at the one and a quarter inch mark and I'm just using my favorite tool is this small clear ruler. And then we are just going to take this extra and we're going to fold it so that the raw edge of the material meets the crease on the inside. So even though the pattern specified allowing one and a half inches for the hem, I just felt like this made a really bulky hem. Um, and I checked later on in the pattern and this hem really doesn't affect the wearability um, or any of the steps further down. 
I also checked the previous chemise I had made and on that one I had made a much narrower hem so I must have realized the same thing then. So my other sleeve I have just folded under an inch um, and use the same process to fold the hem and it's really a small difference. The difference is only a quarter of an inch but I feel like that looks more elegant than this big honking hem. So I'm going to take this out and I'm going to adjust it to be a smaller hem like that. So now it's time to attach our sleeve to the body of our chemise. So I have, just as the instructions say, my chemise with the right side facing out and my sleeve with the wrong side facing out. So I had previously marked when I was cutting out the fabric the center of the sleeve and now I'm going to line up the center of the sleeve with the shoulder seam of the chemise and mark that with a pin. Now I'm going to take the end of the sleeve, swing that over, and line it up here with this end. Now we're going to attach the rest of our sleeve. So making sure that all your seam allowances are facing the correct way, I'm just going to start pinning and easing that sleeve to the body of the chemise. Easing just means you're finagling a bit of the fabric in because you have contrasting curves. This sleeve curves outward and the armhole curves inward, so we just need to reconcile these different curves and just kind of wiggle the fabric between your fingers until you find the spot where it lies flat. And that's actually where our seam is going to go. We just want to make sure that the fabric for the sleeve and the chemise are evenly distributed. So now we have our sleeve attached and we're going to fold it towards the body of the chemise and we're going to attach the underarm facings. These seem complicated but once you start putting them together they're pretty simple. So essentially we're just going to match up and I'm just going to follow the lines of the chemise to match these up. And I have, as per the pattern's instructions, ironed down one quarter of an inch on the edges that will not be stitched in this step. They'll be stitched in the later step, but not yet. So I'm going to continue the same as we did with the sleeves, just easing it around that fullness from the curve. So we have all of our armhole facings stitched on. Um, the instructions don't tell you to press, but I did press after stitching. And now we are going to trim the seams. So as we see, we have three layers of fabric here and they're all stacked up and lining up. And this, when we fold it over and sew, it's gonna create a very obvious ridge and you don't really want that ridge kind of rubbing against your body. It won't be very comfortable. It'll be kind of bulky, especially if you're wearing a corset. So I'm just going to trim, first I'm trimming the seam allowance from the facing and I'm trimming this as close as I can get to the stitches with my scissors. I'm leaving about a little less than a quarter inch of seam allowance. I don't want to go too close to the stitches because I don't want the fabric to fray. And now I'm actually going to leave this sleeve seam allowance intact, but I am going to flip this over so that we get the chemise front and back seam allowances, and I'm gonna trim these as well. I'm not gonna make them as narrow as um, the facing seam allowances. I'm just gonna kinda of cut them in half. And always be careful that you're only cutting through one layer of fabric at a time. Um, I ruined a bodice once when I was trimming the seams, and I just sliced right through the front of the bodice, right over the nipple area. And I couldn't fix anything at that point. It, the fabric was just ruined um, and I had to start all over again. So learn from my mistake. Keep a finger um, in between the two seam allowances or fold one out of the way just to be sure that you're only cutting one layer of seam allowance at a time. I'm using scissors that aren't the sharpest. They're a little bit blunt on the points. So when they're rubbing up against my fingers, they're not causing my fingers any damage. And I use these specifically for trimming seams. We're going to fold our facing to the inside. I'm just lining up the edges of the facing. You're going to pin the facing in place. 
And this is why we only folded under a quarter inch on these sides because this side and this side will actually be encased in seams. This side is going to become the side seam of the chemise and this is going to be encased in the inside yoke. And it, it seems weird, but it makes sense in the process. It's really a piece where you have to trust the process. Although I do think that that obnoxiously large um, hem allowance on the sleeve may have been um, something lost in translation between simplicity and the pattern designer. Because uh, I think that does happen when like historical designers submit patterns to simplicity. I think some things just get boggled up as simplicity is translating them into a commercial pattern. And I think that super wide hem allowance is one of them. Ultimately, I'm glad I went with a smaller hem allowance on the sleeve. I feel like it gives a daintier and more period appropriate look. So I have stitched and pressed my armhole facings and this is what they look like. It's a pretty cool process. Um, they're not that visible from the outside, especially when wearing the garment. And it's nice that they add this extra layer of protection to the garment. And as you can see, they have completely encased the seam of the sleeve. And then this other part of the sleeve seam is actually going to be encased when we apply the yoke that encases the rest of the neckline. So the next step is doing the side seams. And for this, we are doing flat felt seams, which are extraordinarily common in this era. I have stitched up our side seam and now it's time to flat fell the seam. So we're creating our flat fell towards the back of the garment, which means that we're going to find the back. This is the back yoke. And we're going to fold the fell in this direction. So now I'm going to press again pressing the fell towards the back. Now before we turn under our fell, we're actually going to trim this bit of seam allowance on the back side. We're going to fold our fell towards the back, encasing that raw edge. I finished sewing the side seam and flat felling it um, and before I moved on to the yoke I wanted to hem the chemise and I was looking to see if the pattern had any specific instructions for hemming it and it looks like they've actually omitted mentioning hemming the chemise at all. So I don't know if this is a mistake Simplicity did um, or if they assumed that the sewist would know to hem it. I know to hem it um, and I know how to hem so I don't need instructions but just a tip, if you do end up using this pattern, Simplicity 2890, it does omit the instructions to hem the chemise. And the pattern pieces do in fact mention that there is a 5 eighths of an inch um, hem allowed. So, I'm doing the same method that I did with the sleeves, where I'm pressing out the 5 eighths of an inch to the inside of the garment, and then I'm going to take the raw edge and fold it in into that fold and then I'm going to press down and pin to secure that fold. Now it's interesting that they chose 5 eighths of an inch um, to hem the chemise and one and a quarter inch to hem the sleeves. That's further evidence to me that there was a mistake made because it just doesn't make sense to have a narrow hem here and then a really wide hem on the sleeves where it's just extra material that'll be bunched up underneath your dress. So. Just something to keep in mind if you do end up doing this pattern. Also note how when I fold up that 5 eighths of an inch allowance, I'm matching up the side seam so this isn't wonky, it's not tilted to one side or another, but it's lining up with the side seam. And then as I go around the very gentle curve on the hem of the chemise, I'm just easing with the heat of my iron to get it to smooth around that curve. So what I have here is the back yoke and the other two front yokes and I've stitched them together at the shoulder seams, pressed out that seam and now I'm going to press under the seam allowance on this edge because this will be stitched to the other yoke along this edge and then this edge will turn inwards 
and be slip stitched down by hand to the inside of the chemise. Note on the fabric that I'm using, I'm using a fabric called Pima Cotton. Um, it also goes by other names like Pima Tex Cotton or Kaufman Pima Cotton, I think, depending on the brand. It's a very high quality, long fiber cotton, and it's most similar to the kind of cotton that was available in the mid-19th century. Then the pattern instructions tell you to trim away everything that you just pressed um, until there's only a quarter inch of seam allowance left. And then now that I've relieved some of the tension from the curved fabric not wanting to lie flat on this area, I'm just going to go back with the iron and reinforce that curve so we get a really nice clean curve when we go to stitch on the front yoke. Now we have our chemise right side out. We have our pressed and trimmed yoke facing. Because it's so firmly woven, you'll see that even on a bias or a curved edge like this, it's not fraying a bunch. It was life-changing to me when I changed over to the appropriate fabrics for the job, even if they ended up being a few dollars a yard more. The peace of mind that I get from not having to wrangle with a fabric that frays as I look at it is worth so much. It's made a huge difference in what I've been able to create. All right, so I have the other side of the facing stitched on. I still have no idea if I have buggered up this inner corner, but we'll see soon. I have just pressed the stitches and now as per the instructions, I'm going to clip the curves. This will allow, when these curves are then ironed this way, it'll allow this um, fabric to not tucker up. Let's do the same to the other side. Send help. Oh my gosh, why? Why did I think this is going to be fun? Give me 18th century clothing that's just squares and rectangles and triangles. Please have, have mercy on my poor nerves. And magically on this side, I can do it in like three seconds. What is this devilish magic? I have slip stitched the yoke facing down all the way to the inside. Um, this involved then unpicking all those hand stitches and realizing I forgot to trim away the seam allowance for the gather bits and sewing it all a second time. But that's, I was bound to make a mistake eventually. And that's okay. Um, and I managed to sew this part of the placket according to the instructions of the pattern where I basically, and I stitched this by hand, I stitched down this bit of the placket to that little bit, that triangle where we clipped earlier in one of the first steps. Now, I'm not fully understanding what the pattern is telling me to finish off the yoke. Um, the pattern says to fold in the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance on the other bit of the yoke, then trim that seam allowance down to a quarter of an inch and sew it up, and then flip it to the front and lap it over the front, 
However, if I do that, then I still get this piece exposed here and I don't want this to fray and I don't see the point of lapping the front like that. So I'm going to deviate from the pattern's instructions. I have had it with this curved placket nonsense. I am going to leave the left side of the um, yoke placket on top. And then on the inside, I'm going to trim away the seam allowances. And I'm going to kind of sandwich them over that corner bit and sew this down by hand. So I'm going to sew this edge down, sew this edge down, sew it around. So that way on the front it looks like this and on the back I'm able to encase all those raw edges. It's interesting that when I made this other version of the chemise where I had altered the yoke to make it straight rather than curved, I, I did lap right over left but I did a very different placket style that has a little pleat at the bottom of the placket here. So I don't know how appropriate it is to lap left over right on this chemise, but frankly I would rather have the edges lapping the wrong way than having exposed seam allowance that's going to just get destroyed when I wash and wear the garment. So I have trimmed my seam allowances and this is my order of operations. With this tab sticking straight up, I'm first going to lap the bottom piece of this yoke kind of underneath it. And I'm going to flip everything towards the top of the chemise. And then I'm going to take that top part of the placket and fold it over that. And then I'm going to hand stitch all of this down. And that way that should fully enclose that bottom edge of the placket. I'm just taking a few back stitches to secure my thread. It's my favorite method of securing thread at the end of stitching. I find it holds out better than knots and it's also much easier than getting a tight little knot. And there we have it, a curved placket. I conquered this placket, oh my gosh. Now I am going to sew the button and buttonhole. I had previously tried on the chemise and I determined that I wanted my button and buttonhole to be higher. The pattern um, suggests you put the button and buttonhole here, but to avoid this um, from slipping off my shoulders, I'm just going to put the button and buttonhole a bit higher up like that. I have the selection of antique porcelain buttons that I bought off of eBay. They're all different colors, sizes, and styles. Um, some are a little more discolored than others. Uh, some of them have clearly been used and some look brand new, so I wonder if someone has like tried to salvage these from antique undergarments, but this style of button was used primarily in undergarments because it was washable. Um, and actually I have this style of button on the chemises that I've made and worn and washed in a washing machine. And these buttons are like indestructible. The threads that held the button onto my chemise actually deteriorated um, and the button was unharmed. So the button outlasted the thread with which it was sewn. So I'm gonna go with, I think, this pattern.
Despite my frustrations with the placket, I am so pleased with how this chemise turned out and I can't wait to wear it, both at home and at future historic events. And if you're wondering, yes, this chemise does stay up on my shoulders, especially if I have my corset on. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like down below and if you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching and happy sewing!